They came before Columbus, the African presence in ancient America, by Ivan Van Schertema. Chapter 3. The Mariner Prince of Mali. We are vessels of speech. We are the repositories which harbor secrets many centuries old. Without us, the names of kings would vanish from oblivion. We are the memory of mankind. By the spoken word, we bring to life the deeds and exploits of kings for younger generations. History holds no mystery for us. We teach to the vulgar just as much as we want to teach them. For it is we who keep the keys to the twelve doors of Mali. I teach the kings of their ancestors so that the lives of the ancients might serve them as an example. For the world is old, but the future springs from the past. The words of the Mali griot Mamadou Koyate quoted in D.T. Niane Sundiata, an epic of old Mali. A.D. 1217 to 1237. The following is a reconstruction of an event in the medieval empire of Mali based on Arab historical and travel documents and the oral tradition of the Mali griots. Author's note. That morning the king was in a somber mood. Everyone within the palace courtyard sensed it, and as he came through a door in a corner of the palace with the great bow of the Mali kings shining in his hands, a chill fell over the assembly. His golden skull cap was askew, and the dagger-like edges of the broided band looked blunted. He had obviously spent the night nodding and dozing in full royal regalia, for under the velvety red tunic of Mutanfus, the silk was heavily crinkled. Word was passed down through the crowd, waiting under the trees outside the gates, that this was no propitious day to air trivial complaints or broach matters too contentious for quick settlement. The king walked slowly to his pempi with his face down, even the stringed music of the gold and silver Grimbries, which usually brought a softness to his stern, bearded face, sounded tuneless against his expression. Beside him walked his griot, Kuyate, the court historian, stopping when the king stopped, affecting a grave frown to blend with the temper of his master's mood. Behind them trailed a train of three hundred armed servants. The king moved heavily to the Pempi, a three-tiered pavilion which had been set up under a great silk cotton tree dominating the palace yard. He stopped before the silk carpeted steps of the pavilion and for a moment appeared almost frozen in thought, so that the long train of servants, reflecting his stride, became dutifully immobile. For the first time that morning, he lifted his head and looked around. It was a restless, hurried look that took in everything and nothing. He stared for a moment at the white sun of the savannas burning behind the webs of the great tree under which Sandiata, the founder of the empire, once sat. Then, like a preacher ascending his pulpit, he climbed the steps. The moment he was seated on the cushions of the Pempi, under the shade of the royal umbrella, surmounted by its golden bird, there was a roll of drums, and trumpets and bugles sounded. Three pages ran out to summon his deputy and the military commanders of the regions. These dignitaries entered and sat down. There also entered into the king's presence two horses. They were without mounts, 
yet saddled and bridled, cantering with a beautiful control, as though ridden by spirits. Beside them trotted two sacred goats, whom the magicians believed protected their sovereign from the evil eye. It was the year 1310, in the city of Niani, on the left bank of the San Carini. Abu Bakari II, grandson of a daughter of Sundiata, was holding court. One of the military commanders opened the day's business. Things were not going so well for Mali in the siege of Jen. It was a small city, set in the backwaters of the Benai River, a tributary of the Niger, about 300 miles southwest of Timbuktu. But it had repulsed everything the Malayan forces had hurled against it. The news did little to lift Abu Bakari's spirits. He had lost all heart to take Jen. It was a beautiful city, he was told, distinguished by its waterways and the design of its buildings. There were scholars within its walls as learned as the wisest men of Timbuktu, doctors who performed more advanced and delicate operations such as the removal of cataracts, than any then known in the Arab world or Europe. It would be a feather in any conqueror's cap to take Jen. Gaw and Mamadou before him had tried and failed. Jen was protected by treacherous swamps and approachable only by twisting canals and streams. Pour more troops into the battle, the commander advised. But the king shook his head. Leave Jen alone, he said. It is no Taghaza, Tagida, or Kangaba. It has neither salt, copper, nor gold. But he spoke against the counsel of his deputy and commanders without conviction. The truth was, he was tired of this war. Since ascending the throne of Mali, he had but one ambition. It was to use all his power and wealth to realize a dream that had haunted him all through his childhood. Sakura, the slave turned king, the upstart and usurper, had broken the legitimate line of succession of the Mali kings. But during his fifteen years of illicit rule, he had extended Mali down along the Gambia River to the sea. Abu Bakari had heard many tales of that sea. It was known in his boyhood as the world's end. It was also said that the world began and ended in the water. Water stood at the end of the conquered world for Alexander, who, pushing at last to the sea, charged the waves with his horses crying his heart out at the thought that there were no more lands, no more armies or cities to conquer. Water mocked Alexander, upon whom all the Mali kings from Sundiata down had modeled themselves. Water fascinated Abu Bakari II, spacious, mobile, brooding bodies of water. Water was like stored grain at Niani, for it took a full day for the servants to fill the royal jars in the river Kala and return with them to the palace. The boy Abu sometimes thought it strange that his ancestors had built a palace so far from the water's edge. Abu had once traveled in a great canoe down the somber waters of the San Carini. He marveled at the way the boatmen used their paddles to listen to the drumming of fishes and the whisper of currents, and the canoe sped as though it were sliding down a steep floor when the paddlers paused. He wondered dreamily where all the running bright brown water went, as boys are wont to wonder over what strange far-off lands go drifting clouds. 
He had heard that the Senegal and other rivers in his kingdom ran beyond the land into a great sea. Men were more terrified of that sea than of the vast blinding plains of the Sahara. The Arabs called it the Green Sea of Darkness. Few had been known to enter upon it. Fewer still had been known to return. It was said that there was a powerful current, like the hand of a violent god, not far from the land's end, which beckoned bolts into its fingers and threw them out at the uttermost edges of the world, where they fell with the sea into a black hole. But during Sakura's reign, diplomats had come from the court of Morocco who said that this was all nonsense. Brand new ideas about worlds beyond the sea were circulating in North Africa. The works of Abu Zaid, Masudi, Idrisi, Istakiri, and al Feda had trickled down to the university at Timbuktu. Scholars had come more recently, in the time of Gaul and Mamadou, saying strange things that the waters that washed the western end of Mali were not the end of the world at all, that the world had no end, for it was built like a bottle gourd. If you put your finger at any point of a gourd and try to trace a line across it, his griot told him, you will come out at the end of the line to the point where you started, beginning again at the point where it seemed you had come to an end. So it was with the world. Thus would a man return to the very spot from which he had set out, if he could march or sail across the circle of the gourd-shaped world. But there were those, the most closed and conservative of the clerics, who felt that the new thinkers in North Africa were presumptuous, romantic, insane. How could they believe that men were walking upside down in unknown lands at the bottom of the gourd-shaped world? He was glad that Kanyate, like Bala Fuseke, Sandiata's griot, had too lively and questioning a spirit to allow these reactionaries to reign in his imagination, had lived too close to the Mandingo magicians to forget that he himself was a vital force among the forces, and not a mere victim of pre-arranged destiny. Kankan Kan Musa, his brother, took the Muslim clerics more seriously, but he, Abu, had always been in secret conflict with them. He had worn the robes of a Muslim when he was inaugurated as emperor of the twelve kings of Malai. But he was no more a Muslim than were the feathered and masked magicians of his court. He had even encouraged them to perform their rites ostentatiously on Muslim festival days. True, he appreciated his association with Islam, the superficial but diplomatically important link through this international religion between his and the Arab courts. But Mali had gone its own way and would continue to do so. Little did he owe to the Arab Muslims by way of the rituals of his culture, the appearance of his court, or the legal, political structure of his government. He was vital to them, as they to him. Even Europe depended on the gold the Arabs got from him for their currency and jewels. The first coins to circulate in Europe since Roman times were minted from his gold. Thousands of Arab and African caravans every year passed through Timbuktu and Niani and the invincible little city of Jen, keeping the line of exchange and communications open between his dominions and Cairo. He had given, as had his ancestors before, most generously to the Muslim teachers and scribes at Timbuktu, but he would never allow them to take their ideology too far. Diplomacy was diplomacy. Trade was trade, but culture and religion were inseparable strands of a native and sacred tradition. It was the lifeblood of the people. He understood why, on closer reflection, 
Sundiata had built his palace at Niani, close to the life of the cultivators, the life of the people on the land. Sometimes the kings of Mali had shifted their capital, but never away from the heartland of the peasants, where they could lose the feel of the earth from which they sprang. He had found it amusing when he heard how the gold diggers of Bambouk had withdrawn from trade with Muslims when they tried to slip their alien god in among the Arabian silks and amulets and perfumes. He knew when he ascended the throne that many a Muslim devotee in the circles of the court would scoff at his trans-oceanic scheme. Several Mali kings, after they had taken their conquest to the limits their power would allow, had but one conventional ambition. His brother, Kan Kan Musa, was already talking about it. If Kan Kan Musa ever succeeded him, he would choose that way to make his mark upon the world, to lead a massive train of caravans, like the tribes of Israel on the move, across the desert to Mecca. It was less his brother's Muslim faith, Abu Nu, than the desire to impress the Arabs, their greatest allies and rivals, with Mali's great wealth and power. Abu wanted to do something different, something new, something for which there was no precedent. Something, too, that would keep his spirit quick and young with a lifelong excitement. He was bored by petty wars, which meant so little in terms of new territory. Now that Mali had extended itself down to the deserts of the north and the jungles of the south, as far east as the copper mines of Takeda, and as far west as the great and mysterious waters of the Western Sea. He was master of the largest empire in the world. Larger, said the Arabs, than the Holy Roman Empire. Large as all the civilized states of Europe. Where would be the Alexandrian joy that Sundiata, or his adversary, Sumanguru, the sorcerer, felt when they started out on their great campaigns? And he was bored by the thought of a pilgrimage, even if it involved mile-long trains of camels and people, as Can Can liked to dream his would. He was bored by pious duties and by pious men. They repeated themselves endlessly. Some of the muezzins of the mosque reminded him of crickets singing at sundown in the darkening savannas. He could not conceal a certain hostility and contempt. Quranic recitals fell like an icy breath upon the warm, turbulent spirit of the Bambaras. Muslims were terrified of real life, he felt, terrified of the senses, terrified of the primitive power of sex. They were alarmed to see his grown-up daughter swim stark naked in the kala, while they entombed their women up to their eyes in cloth. He surrounded himself with people of like mind, scholars of Timbuktu, who entertained theories of a gourd-shaped world and dreamed of lands beyond the waters, as men now dream of life on land beyond the stars. The king gave all his attention to these men, so much so that affairs of state began to suffer, and even his griot tactfully reminded him of Kalabi Dalman, the ancestor of those who preferred adventure to the responsibilities of government. The king turned his head away. Mali was strong enough, and his tribute paying estates independent and loyal enough at this stage to sustain good and easy government. He would lose no time in the endless task of administration. He would spare no pains to build a fleet. Let it be known throughout Mali and beyond by all those who fished and sailed in lakes and rivers and off the sea's great coast, and who knew about boats and the water and currents and winds and direction finding by the map of the stars and about all such nautical things that they were needed at the court. Let the Bozo come forward and the Simono to whom Sundiata had given the monopoly of the water and the boatmen of the Niger and the Gambia and the Senegal and let messengers go even unto Lake Chad 
beyond the copper mines of Takeda, where it was said that men still built boats on the principles of the ancient Egyptians. Night and day it was the talk of the courts. The king himself was sometimes confounded by the conflicting tales and theories of his advisers. Some said it was pointless to call on the experience of the river people. The sea to the west was no river. It did not behave like an inland lake or stream. One would have to build something truly massive to meet its monstrous moods. River craft would simply be dashed to pieces. Others said big ships sank more easily on stormy water than small ones. They set up too much resistance to the wind and waves. One man came forward from a fishing village on the western border of Mali. He lived on the edge of the sea. He said there were seasons when it was still as smooth as a lake of glass and the problem was not the winds and the waves at all, but the great calms. A big ship could sit on the water for days like a stone small boats like his had traveled on the ocean and once caught in the storm he had drifted for a few days until he came to an island the king listened to this with great excitement but the old man finished his story by saying that the island was small and poor as barren as a sandbank and that no one lived there an Arab captain who had come up the Niger River to Timbuktu had heard of the king's great interest said there was truth in the old man's tale, that he had heard of similar islands visited by North African sailors, but that they also were small and poor, and the people who lived on some of them were simple-minded folk. But these, he assured the king, were not the lands of the great ocean. They merely stood on its edge. If one sailed on and on, perhaps, one would then come to a vast new world on the other side. Great discussions arose as to what kind of ship should be built. Some of his advisors said it should most certainly carry a sail. Others that they should not depend on the sail, for they could be stalled for days on the sea when the winds dropped. The ship should be like the Dua La Interpe, the Bantu and Arabs of East Africa were using on the Indian Ocean, which could shift from sail to oar and oar to sail, so that it would have the double advantage of wind and muscle power. All that was needed, said one scholar, was the initial thrust. Birds were observed to fly for thousands of miles without getting tired. This was because they traveled on a moving stream or current in the air and could sleep with open wings, drifting with no muscular power across the lands of the world. He believed there were such streams and currents in the ocean. Abu Bakari listened to all this, but took no chances. There would be no single design, no one kind of boat. He would give his blessing to all that seemed practical. He was not going to gamble on one man's theory and ignore the rest. He saw the configuration of his fleet like the political configuration of Mali. At its helm stood he, the central and unifying authority, under him the most diverse and incongruous crew of elements on the Sudanic deck of the world. His fleet would be a mirror of his ship of state. A broad plain was chosen along the Senegambia seacoast of Mali for the great boat building operations. Troops were withdrawn from the east where they were skirmishing with the Songhai and from other minor campaigns to focus their energies on this. The most ambitious of all campaigns. Great trees from the inland forest were felled and floated down the rivers to the border coast. Smiths carpenters, captains of provision boats along the Niger, caravan guides who used the compass and nautical instruments to plot their paths across the sandy sea of the Sahara, magicians and diviners, 
Dankers from Timbuktu, grain and gold merchants, potters, porters, weavers and jewelers were all assembled in that place. While the building of the boats progressed, a number of megaliths were erected, crude stone observatories, such as ancient seafaring nations used for astronomical calculations, the ruins of which survive today as indicators of the science of that time and the activities of that place. The king specified that each boat built for the ocean voyages should be accompanied by or attached to a supply boat, which stored gold and other items of trade, along with dried meat and grain and preserved fruit and huge ceramic jars to last its company in the master boat for at least two years. Four times as long as the stocks of the trans-Saharan caravans from Cairo to the Sudan. 200 master boats were built and 200 supply boats. As the task neared completion, Abu Bakri left his palace at Niani and encamped on the seacoast to watch the final stages of the operation. It was the scene an Egyptian pharaoh must have witnessed during the erection of a pyramid. He felt pride at the thought that he was probably the only king in the world at that time who was wealthy enough and enough at peace within his borders to divert such a vast labor force from its military and agrarian duties to gratify his royal whim. He would go beyond Sundiata after all, beyond the wildest territorial ambitions of the Mali kings, even beyond Alexander, the mighty king of gold and silver, whose sun shone over half the world. He called the captains of the boats together and issued this order. Do not return until you have reached the end of the ocean, or when you have exhausted your food and water. They went away, and their absence was long. None came back, and their absence continued. The king could not find peace. He was obsessed by the arrow he had hurled across the spaces of the ocean. What land would it strike? Where would it fall from his flight to the end of the unknown world? He could think of nothing else. He found no joy in his food, his wives, or his children. No comfort in music or the discourse of his griot. He yawned and made impatient signs during important discussions of affairs of state. He called in the soothsayers. They could see nothing. It is too soon, Sultan, the old men said. But early that morning, before he had entered the palace yard to hold audience at the court, he had a dream from which he awoke trembling. In this dream he saw hundreds of blackbirds drifting lazily across the sky. One of them in the tail of the flock began to fall. It fell clear out of the sky and hit him like a gourd, which then cracked and spilled white froth and salt sea water. The other birds turned to a cloud in the distance and dissolved. He confided this dream to Koyate, who said it was an omen, and he would soon hear news. Was it good news or bad news? The king pressed him. Koyate was cautious. The drift of the birds was good news. The fall of the tail was bad. It could be seen both ways, he said. In the midst of the discussion about Jen, a commotion was heard outside the gates. The king, aroused by an obscure flicker of his instincts, half rose from the pempi. A murmur ran through the court. It was soon conveyed to Abu Bakri that a captain of one of the ships was waiting outside the gates to have an audience. Let him take precedence, said the king, curtly dismissing the business at hand whereupon a man came forward dressed in ritually poor garments and a dirty skull cap, holding his trousers knee-high as he approached the king's platform. He shuffled forward in an attitude of reverent humility, knocking the ground with his elbows. Then 
as he came within a few yards of the Pempe, stood up with bowed head, waiting for permission to speak. The king forgot himself. He descended the Pempe in one step. The captain of the boat, fearing his wrath, began to speak. Sultan, we sailed for a long while until we came to what seemed to be a river with a strong current flowing in the open sea. My ship was last, the others sailed on, but as they came to that place they were pulled out to sea and disappeared. All is lost then, said the king. I do not know, sire. I do not know what became of them. The waters there were strong and swift, and I was afraid. I turned where I was and did not enter that current. The king stared at him for a long while. The captain took a handful of dust and threw it nervously over his head, and back like a bather splashing himself with water. The king returned to his pempy without a word. He clapped his hands and dismissed the court. This news made Abu Bakr the second more fixed in his obsession. Some said it made him mad. He abandoned the Yanni and journeyed with a greater part of his court to the plain at the western edge of Mali, where the first fleet had been fitted out and had disembarked. Like the pyramid builders of dynastic Egypt, he began to reorganize his whole empire around a single massive project. Word was sent out to the provincial governors and passed down to the Contigi, the political chiefs of the villages, that all gold, all grain, after due deduction for official services, should be sent on to his camp on the Senegambian plain. A vast army of craftsmen, dwarfing the planners and workers of the first expedition, were assembled on that plain. Caravans which came into Niani in that period found the army, the royal family, and its vast retinue, the drummers and the buglers and the medicine men, all gone. Paired men and women were being chosen for the new expedition, and fears were expressed that the king in his madness would sacrifice hundreds of his subjects to the devils of the dark sea. Abu Bakari II never looked back. He never returned to the court at Niani. This time he had a special boat built for himself, with a pempi on the poop deck shaded by the bird-emblazoned parasol. He would commandeer the new expedition himself, keeping in touch with the captains of the fleet by means of the talking drum. Thus, in 1311, he conferred the power of the regency on his brother, Kankan -Kan Musa, on the understanding that Kankan -Kan was to assume the throne if, after a reasonable lapse of time, the king did not return. Then, one day, dressed in a flowing white robe and a jeweled turban, he took leave of Mali and set out with his fleet down the Senegal, heading west across the Atlantic never to return. He took his griot and half his history with him. End of chapter 3